thought I'd be interested in, so I thought I'd read it to you. Joy isn't the natural response to blessings. Joy is what comes from acknowledging them. So that gives you a little bit of difference you know, of what joy is. And, I, and you know, everybody knows what the difference in a bad haircut and a good haircut is, right? Three days. <laughs> Two weeks, generally. <laughs> Three, Three days. It takes mine a little bit longer, hopefully. It, I think me and John McFarlane was in a contest yesterday. <laughs> who could get the shortest haircut? But he was here. Yeah, he was. He anyway. He's back here in the room, I think. A man bought his wife a piano for her birthday. A few weeks later, a friend asked how she was doing with it. Oh, said the man, I persuaded her to switch to a clarinet. How come, the friend asked. Well, because with a clarinet, she can't sing. Oh. And I don't like these new glasses. Did they make you read it wrong? Yeah. So today we're going to continue in our study of the book of James. We're still in James first, uh, chapter 1. Today we'll be covering verses 13 through 18. Last week we talked a lot about trials and temptations, but we, we kind, of, kind of parked on trials last week. This week we parked more on the temptation part of it. So who would like to volunteer me read verses 13 through 18? Do I need to appoint someone? Marie, you have it? No. I'm sorry, I'm Jim, you have it? I don't have my phone with me. Well, I'll read it. Deborah, you have it, I know. Yes. When tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Okay, thanks, Deborah. So the mature person is patient in trials. If we're not careful when our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, questioning his love, and resisting his will. It is at this point Satan provides us with an opportunity to escape the difficulty. And, of course, this opportunity is a temptation. Can you think of any examples in the Bible where this happened or something similar? Where they wanted to escape the difficulty? Yeah. They thought they knew better than God. Start with AI. Okay. What happened to AI? Else didn't take any of the silver, but this guy saw it. Okay. And then the eyes just buried for a while. Okay. Anybody, any any other example? Take the Bible. Bathsheba taking a bath into the river. That's right. <laughs> and if David had realized what the, the <clears throat> end result and the circumstances were going to turn into, he may have changed his mind about his actions on that one. Maybe. Samson. Samson was a good one. How about the Israelites when they were out in the desert? Uh, they ran out of water. What happened? Wine. They whined about it. And then once they found water, what happened? Everybody remember? No, no. They ran out of water for about three days. They didn't have any water. When they, did, they found When they found water, what was the circumstances? It was bitter. It was bitter. Yeah. yeah. They whined about it. So when they found water, it was bitter. <coughs> And on and on they, they went. So there's other examples uh, about that type of thing. God does not want us to yield to temptation, yet neither can he sp spare us the experience of temptation. We are not God's sheltered people living in a, in a bubble. If we are to mature, we must face testing and temptations. There are three facts that we must consider if we are to overcome temptation. The first one is consider God's judgment, verses 13 through 16. Do not blame God for temptation. He is too holy to be tempted and too loving to tempt others. God does not and cannot tempt us. 
It is we who turn occasions of testing into temptations. So my first question, how would you define what a temptation is? And we talked about this briefly last week. But how would you define what a temptation is? In a broad sense, not specifically. To me, chocolate cake is a temptation. <laughs> I'd be someone else's problem. Outside of God's will. Doing something outside of God's will. That's one way of putting it. Matter of fact, that's pretty well on target. A temptation is a trial in which man has a free choice of being either faithful or unfaithful to God. It's also an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way out of the will of God. I have an example of passing a test. Cheating to pass the test would be a sin. Passing the test would be okay, but cheating to do it would be a sin. Anybody ever heard the phrase, like, the end does not justify the means? So that's what we run into sometimes. Unless you live in D.C. And, uh, <laughs> unless you live anywhere. <laughs> I've seen people use it down here, so. I think it's worse up there. It's, well, we won't go there. Last, let me clarify something that came up last week. Wayne asked a question last week, and I answered it in the negative. His question was, can we be tempted to do good? And I answered in the negative. I said no. I want to clarify that I found support to say that, we, that he, can, he does, or we can be. Jerry Starlin had an article that I read. Does anybody know Jerry Starlin? Know the name? He, he used to work with, uh, and he still may, I think he's dead now. Anyway, Eastern European Missions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think his brother's name Harvey. That's yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. the one I remember. Yeah. But he has a, a Montgomery connection, so that's the one reason why I knew it. But the, Jerry said this one of the rules, one of the roles the Holy Spirit plays is to tempt us to do good by nudging us in the right direction. Have you ever experienced times when you had an unusual urge to do a good deed? And Jerry gives this example. Have you ever experienced a bout of anger at someone and said things you later regretted, but then you had that nudge to apologize and try to set things right? If the devil can tempt us to do evil, it stands to reason that the Holy Spirit can tempt or nudge us to do good. So, Wayne, I stand corrected. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Would that's, you a, use that's a loose definition. Yeah. It is a loose, loose definition. Very loose definition. <laughs> I think temptation is mostly considered in conjunction with sin. It is. You, in general terms, when we think about I, temptation, we I don't know if you sin. remember last week, but I changed my mind before the end of the Oh, did you? <laughs> I only went back and listened to the tape for the question, so I'll make sure I had the right question. But, but um, you, we do know that God can tempt us to. So, but he can't tempt us when it has to be evil. Right? Has to be what? Has to be evil. Evil? Right. Okay. Uh, well, again, using Deborah's, Deborah's definition of temptation, you know, she, she's saying we're stretching the envelope on that. So, but it, it's a subject for more debate later. Yeah. So, okay. So, anyway, continue on in your notes. We normally call that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good. Maybe we should turn, change our phrase on that question. So we think of sin as a single act, but we see in verses fourteen and fifteen that God sees it as a process. And James describes the process of sin in four stages. The first stage is desire, in verse fourteen. A person's own evil desires is what causes a person to be tempted by evil. What does the word lust mean? Anyone? Temptation of vision. Temptation of what? Vision. Of vision. Desire. Okay. Desire is the word I'm looking for. Any kind of desire. 
The normal desires of life were given to us by God and, and of themselves are not sinful. Without these desires, we could not function. What would happen if we never felt hunger or thirst? We'd be dead because we wouldn't eat or drink, right? Uh, what would happen if we never felt fatigue? We wouldn't rest. We'd just keep on go going. Our bodies would wear out. It is when we want to satisfy these desires in ways outside God's will that we get into trouble. Eating is normal, gluttony is sin, sleep is normal, laziness is sin. These desires must be our servants and not our masters, and this we can do through Jesus Christ. The second stage in the process of sin is deception, verse, again verse 14. No temptation appears as temptation, but always seems more alluring than it really is. James used two illustrations from the world of sports to prove his point. The in, uh, New International Version and the Amplified Version uses the, term, the words dragged away. Uh, the uh, New American Standard uses carried away, and King James uses drawn away. This phrase carries with it the idea of the baiting of a trap, and the word enticed in the original Greek means to bait a hook. Do you want to have an English Standard Version Bible? Valerie, do you raise your hand? All right. What does verse 14 say at the very close to the end? We're looking for one word begins with an L. Lure. How do we what do we use when we go fishing? A lure. So English Standard is using that exact word for baiting the hook. The Greeks had a special word for the portion of an animal trap where the bait was laid. It was called a scandalon. This is the area, like in the mouse trap, where we, you would actually lay the cheese on the mechanism. It's where we get our word scandalize, which means to trip somebody up or to cause someone to sin. Will an animal deliberately step into a trap or will fish knowingly bite at a naked hook? Usually not. I have caught some catfish on a naked hook. <laughs> It was a very well stocked pond, and you could just throw it out there and they would go after it. So that's the reason I said usually not, but normally no is the answer. What does the hunter or fisherman do up to up his odds of catching his prey? He disguises the trap. He uses bait and then he disguises that bait. And kind of to hide the, he usually hides the trap if it's a trapping type of situation. Temptation always carries with it some bait that appeals to our natural desires. The bait will not attract us. Not, I'm sorry, the bait not only attracts us, but it also hides the fact that yielding to the desire will eventually bring sorrow and punishment. The bait keeps us from seeing the consequences of sin. What was the bait that drew Lot toward Sodom in, in Genesis 13? Well watered. Green grass. The grass was greener in that direction. So that's the way he went. We've already talked about David and the consequences there. So when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he always dealt with the temptation on the basis of the word of God. When you know the Bible, you can detect the bait and deal with it decisively. This is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. The third stage of the process of sin is in verse 15, is disobedience. We have moved from the emotions, which is the desire part, the intellect, which is the deception part, and now we look at the will. The will approves and acts, and the result is sin. Whether we feel it or not, we are hooked and trapped. Christian living is a matter of the will, not the feelings. Children operate on the basis of feelings, but adults operate on the basis of will. This explains why immature Christians easily fall into temptation, letting their feelings make the decisions. And the final phase comes from verse 15 also. What is the result of full-grown sin? Death. death. It may take years for the sin to mature, but when it does, the result will be death. If we will only believe God's word and see his final tragedy, tragedy, it will encourage us not to yield to temptation. These four stages of temptations and skill and sin are perfectly depicted in the first sin recorded in the Bible. Before I do that, what does verse 2 of our 
of an invitation song today said, if I remember, I need thee every hour. Temptations lose their power while thou art nigh. So, there we go. And I did not set that up with Chip. But he, he <laughs> I would, I would disagree. I want to be sure we understand that we primarily look at death as physical. Yeah. But death in the Bible is separation from yeah. God. Yes. And that does not wait. Right. That's immediate. Right. And, and on that point, let's keep on going and looking at the first sin in the in the garden. Serpent used desire to interest Eve. What was the deception or what was the bait for Eve? What did they use with Eve? Yeah. yeah, it was the forbidden tree. Tree was good and pleasant that even it would make her wise. So that was the bait. Then she saw the bait, but forgot God's warning. Right? Eve disobeyed God by taking the fruit of the tree and eating it. Then she shared it with her husband. And he disobeyed also. So it wasn't a physical death. And that's what Eve thought the, the, the Satan was talking about. But he was talking about, no, he was talking about physical death. She thought she, he was talking about something else. So it ended up being a spiritual death, of course. We know the story. We know the, the rest of the story. And, of course, they were thrown out of the garden. So she did not, Adam and Eve did not physically die, but they spiritually died. For a little while. Right, Jim? Thank you. So whenever you're forced, whenever you're faced with temptation, get your eyes off the bait and look ahead to see the consequences of sin, the judgment of God. I think a mouse trap helps is the best illustration of that because a, a fish can sometimes get off of a hook. Yeah. It depends on the skill, I guess, of the fisherman. Uh, fisher woman, but, um, <laughs> and animal wild animals have been known to chew off a limb yeah. that's in a trap. Yeah. But a mouse is dead. <laughs> well, well, I've seen mice. You see I've seen mice get cheese off. Yeah, in Arkansas do it yeah. all the time. <laughs> Arkansas, Arkansas. Yeah, I've, I've seen. I haven't seen them, but I've seen the results of them getting the cheese off. I've only ever seen dead. <laughs> So any other questions or comments about the four stages of the process of sin? And we read, read about 14 and 15. Yes, ma'am. I guess I just always think of it as the thoughts. It's, it's always going to start with my thoughts. Correct. That's where the temptation is. Right. And that um, also that, well, what does it say? Let me finish up the first time. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. What's the pride, pride of pride life. Lies. The pride of life. Yeah. So those, but... but um, and any sin falls into one of those three categories. And, but I also think, like, I don't think Jesus resisted temptation because he was afraid of death. He resisted because he was focused on loving God. Yeah. And for me, that really helps a lot, too. I, think I don't want to hurt God. He cares about me so much that it hurts him when I sin. That's what I believe in anyway, yeah. for any of us. You know, focusing on that is also a really great motivation. And another thing is just, you know, like it talks about here that, and other places to just look away mm -hmm. or turn it off or yep. whatever. It, Run. You know, yeah, and replace <laughs> that thought with a good one. Get behind me, Satan. So, yeah. Just like, like our physical parents, I, I was the oldest child, so I was having the, I, I'm the one who, always tried to do the right thing and do what mama and daddy said to do and do it and blah, blah. Because I didn't want to disappoint them. When a brother comes along, he's a little bit different story. I can't say too much because Whitney's here and Whitney knows my brother. <laughs> so I can't say too much. You know, I, I used to think that's how I, I was the troublemaker. And my brother was, was more like you. And about two or three years ago, my mom told me that when my brother was my age, he was a lot worse than me. We were actually happy to have such an easy child. And I thought, holy cow, how can that be? Yeah. So sometimes our own perceptions are, yeah. are warped. Because I was sure I was the trouble. I know I was after college. Yeah. It went downhill. 
Yeah, I guess. <laughs> do, you, do you think that any time we give in to uh, temptation that it leads to death? And if that's the case, then what happens to grace? Well, going through this fourth step process, no, you can you can you can turn and cut your ties and run at any point, in my opinion. The point is, if you go through all four stages, it, the end result will be death. Uh, here again, it's not necessarily a physical death. It could be, depends on what you're doing. I mean, if, if, if you start out, I mean, if you ended up a drug addict, yeah, that could be a physical death at some point. Well, wouldn't the separation from God be, that kind of, type of death be a loss of salvation? Yeah. I have a solution to this. Please. This is, <laughs> this is why I have this been building this illustration. It's one of the reasons. I've said it many times about God's view of time. Yeah. He is not subject to time. Days a thousand he can words see days. the beginning and the end, I believe, in one view. And when we think about falling in and out of grace, that is a time-constrained activity. I think that God's view is that point at the end. Here's our traveling. He's got to help us along the way, but he, he sees the end point, whether it's at our death or judgment day or something. He's looking at this for every one of us. Our life is right here, and he's going to help us along the way. And we have choices along the way, so he knows what's going to happen. And he knows it's, it's all part of that same thing where I've, I've said, you know, a lot of you have heard me say, God, can, God knows exactly what nudge here to make something happen three generations later. He has this very clear view of all of time. He is not constrained by time. And I really think the whole idea of falling in and out of grace is a concept that we have simply because we are constrained by time. But imagine if we weren't constrained by time, and God is. He simply sees the end point. How many times do we talk, does the Bible talk about shooting for the goal, shooting for the finish line? Yeah. And it's, the, it's that whole idea. And this is one of the very important concepts in that because it is confusing. Oh, did I fall out of grace? Did I fall in grace? Did I fall out of grace? Am I, what, what am I? Well, I think along the way, the devil is going to be trying to do his will. God is helping you along the way. But the whole time, he is looking at this point but, in your life. But, David, don't you think that God knows all the endpoints and that all the endpoints are does. decided? By our decisions. Yep. And so they are. If he knows all the endpoints, the endpoint can change constantly. Every time you make a change. If you're change. constrained by time. God's view of the endpoint, of he, my endpoint. You may know the final endpoint, but what I'm saying is that endpoint can be different based on the decisions you make. You're, you're okay. confusing the concept of constrained by time and not constrained by time. Okay, I'm going to cut y'all off. Okay, I'm going to cut y'all right. off right here. Because Don't do that, this Lynn. This is so interesting. This is not a lesson. <laughs> Please. There's something heavy. <laughs> I'm going to let Gary preach a sermon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, how did he do that? So, you know, pass the buck off to Gary. Uh, the second fact we must consider if we are to overcome temptation is God's goodness. Verse 17, what comes down from the Father of lights, according to verse 17? Every good and perfect gift. So let's, let's, let's clarify things, a couple, a couple of things first. Who is the Father of lights? God. Why is God called the Father of lights? He created what? Okay, the heavenly bodies. Which is the light. The light of the world. Of, yeah. The universe, which includes the sun, moon, and stars. Are there any other verses of the Bible that refer to God as the Father of lights? Can you think of any? One or two or any? You're right, there are no, 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 no none others. This is the only one. Did anybody catch that? The answer is no, there are no other verses that refer to God as Father of Light. Well, That's supposed to be my joke at the 10 minute mark that Gary likes to throw out. 
Do I? <laughs> Father of the heavenly life. Yeah, but as far as, but anyway. <laughs> I, I, I blew it. Great I, joke, man. I'm going to mark that one out and never use that one again. <laughs> Put a big X on it. One of the enemy's tricks is convince us that our Father is holding out on us, and that he does not really love us and care for us. Satan suggested to Eve that if God really loved her, he would permit her to eat of the, of the forbidden tree. Since God is good, we do not need any other person, including Satan, to meet our needs. It is better to be hungry and in the will of God than full outside the will of God. Once we start to doubt God's goodness, we will be attracted to Satan's offers and the natural desires within will reach out for, for his faith. Moses warned Israel not to forget God's goodness when they be, began to enjoy the blessings of the promised land in Deuteronomy 6. Do we sometimes get comfortable with things going well? Yep, we do. So James presented four facts about the goodness of God. God gives only good gifts. Everything good in this world comes from God, and if we do not see the goodness in it immediately, and we, and even if we do not see it immediately, if it did not come from God, it is not good. Talk about things like confusion, confusion, confusion. Fear, lying, murder, arrogance, vanity, envy, guilt that is counterproductive, selfish ambition. Number two, the way God gives is good. When God gives us a blessing, he does it in a loving, gracious manner. What he gives and how he gives are both good. He gives constantly. God is constantly giving, not just occasionally. Even when we do not see his gifts, he is sending them. And God does not change. It is impossible for God to change he cannot change for the worse because he is holy. He, not, he cannot change for the better because he's already perfect. We should never question God's love or doubt. His goodness when difficulties come or temptations appear. God's gifts are always better than Satan's bargains. The next time you're tempted, meditate on the goodness of God in your life. If you think you need something, wait on the Lord to provide it. Never toy with the devil's bait. One purpose for temptation is to <coughs> teach us patience. On two occasions, David was tempted to kill King Saul, but resisted and waited for God's time. Any comments about God's goodness? Or questions? I think sometimes we fail to recognize, and I know a lot of times I fail, I fail to be grateful. Yeah, and, and we've said it before. We're always real good about praying when we need something or we want something, but we're not real good about praying once he's given us what we've got. So. I think as I got older, I do that more often. Yeah. Because you appreciate the good when it does come yeah. more when you're old. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Oh, I've got a lot more praise than now. Yeah. And some of that is the wisdom to know the difference <laughs> when we do receive something. And we've also recognized that some of the things that we wanted and we prayed about that God didn't give us, we were blessed that he yeah. didn't give yeah. us. Yeah. Right. And that, I think that takes a little time. Yeah, and that's maturity, like David said. So, yeah. The final fact we must consider to overcome temptation is God's divine nature within. This comes from verse 18. <laughs> By what means did God choose to give us life? The word. The word. The word of truth. James used birth as a picture to desire leading to as a picture of desire leading to sin and death. He also used it to explain how we can enjoy victory over temptation and sin. Apostle John used a similar approach in 1 John 3, 9, where, John, where God's seed refers to the divine life and nature within the believer. There are four characteristics of this birth. The first one is, it is divine. So what did Nicodemus think when he heard Jesus talking about being born again in John 3? Anybody remember the story? Second, second birth to his mother's birth. Yeah, he thought it was a physical birth, a second rebirth physically. 
And he said, I'm out of luck. My mom's dead. <laughs> yeah, he thought he, he thought we, he had to re-enter his mother's womb to be born again. The birth is not of the flesh. The Greek for the, the Greek for the word again in verses three and seven also means from above. It is the work of God, just as we did not generate our own human birth, we cannot generate our own spiritual birth. Again, means saved again. The Greek word of, uh, for again in verses 3 and 7 also means from above. That's what I read. Uh, you find out different, let me know. No, no, that's, that's uh, yeah. Oh, I'm serious. If you yeah. find out different, let me know. No, I just do you want to have a Greek Bible with them? Yeah, right. <laughs> In my office. In your office? <laughs> Let me grab it for you so you can read it. <laughs> I'll be healthy. <laughs> uh, where am I? Oh, it is the work of God just that we did not generate our own human birth, we cannot generate our own spiritual birth. Second characteristic is it is gracious. We did not earn it or deserve it. God gave us spiritual birth because of his own grace and will. No one can be born again because of his relatives, his resolutions, or his religion. Third one is, it is through God's word. Just as a human birth requires two parents, divine birth has two parents, the word of God and the spirit of God. Since the word of God is living and powerful, it can generate life in the heart of a sinner who trusts Christ. And finally, it is the finest birth possible. James used the word first fruits, which would have been meaningful to these Jewish Christians. The Old Testament Jews brought the first fruits of the Lord as an expression of their devotion and obedience. Of all the creatures God has in this universe, Christians are the very highest and the finest. We share God's nature. For this reason, it is beneath our dignity to accept Satan's faith or desire sinful things, a higher birth means a higher life. By granting us a new birth, God declares that he cannot accept the old birth. Throughout the Bible, God rejects the firstborn and accepts the secondborn. He accepted Abel, not Cain, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. He rejects your first birth and announces that you need a second birth. It is this experience of the new birth that helps us overcome temptation. If we let the old nature from the first birth take over, we will fail. We received our old nature, the flesh, from Adam, and he was a failure. But if we yield to the new nature, we will succeed, for the new nature comes from Christ, and he is the victor. Of course, this new nature must be fed the word of God daily, that it might be strong to fight the battle. This is the Holy Spirit used the word of God to give you spiritual birth. He uses the word to give you spiritual strength. Any questions on God's divine nature? So God always gives more credit to the second birth. How do you, you explain King David? Is he like the so far down to the family? <laughs> <Number eight. laughs> he certainly was first, but was it? Number eight. Number eight, yeah. I could, I could Solomon was number four. He didn't say always, it just yeah, didn't have a lot of examples. <laughs> didn't say always. That's, that's one of my pet peeves, always and never. Yeah. Nothing is always and nothing is never. So. Actually, some things are. But... <laughs> <laughs> you need to take a lesson from here and check. No matter what excuses we make, we have no one to blame for sin but ourselves. God is not to blame. Also, despite what Whip Wilson used to say, the devil does not make you do anything. It is our, it is our own desires that lead us into temptation and sin. Anybody have any final questions about what we've talked about today? <coughs> Other than the salvation of grace. <laughs> Hey, next week, I know you've been wondering how long it's going to take us to get through chapter one. <laughs> we will, hopefully we'll finish up chapter one next week when we talk about the dangers of self-deception. You know, we'll put the last slide over there. Oh, was there one after the questions? Yeah. Oh, you got it. Flip it. Was it though?
I went to a lot of work to get I this. Know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, what can I say? There we go. Oh, you're <laughs> 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 I took like 15 minutes onto this slide and created it, and he didn't want to use it. <laughs> Seriously, anybody, anybody have any final words or questions or anything? All right, we'll finish up chapter one hopefully next week. So everyone have a great week. Stay safe if you go 98 or anywhere. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.